PC recording is up. Cloud recording is good. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Keith, will you begin with your opening statement? Yep. Good morning, and welcome to the remote hearing on landmarks, public sightings, and dispositions. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Good morning. I'm Council Member Kevin Riley, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Science, and Dispositions. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Council Member Kuhl, Barron, Reynoso, and Dharma Diaz. Today, we will vote on the designation of the Doris Brooks Square Historic District and a proposed site selection for a new DOT facility at 101 Varick Avenue in Brooklyn, both of which we heard at our September 13th meeting. We will, hear, we will then hear three HPD projects, Cooper Park Commons, Glenmore Manor, and the TMN 1002 West Harlem Renaissance UDAP and Article 11. We will vote to approve LU828, the designation of the Dorrance Brook Square Historic District, which includes approximately 325 buildings in two sections of Frederick Douglass Boulevard in Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. This is the first historic district in New York City named for an African American. We will also vote to approve LU835 101 Varick Avenue. This item is an application submitted by the Department of Transportation and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to the section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the site selection and acquisition of a property located at 101 Varick Avenue in Brooklyn for use as a DOT operation and warehouse facility. This site is located in the district represented by Councilmember Reynoso. We will now vote to approve LU 828 and 835. Council, please call the roll. Riley. Aye. Coup. I will aye. Barron. I vote aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and with zero abstentions, the items are approved and referred to the full land use committee, and we will hold the vote open. Thank you, Council. I now recognize Council to explain today's hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Riley. I am Jeffrey Campagna, Council to this subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you registered to testify and are not yet signed into Zoom, please sign in now and remain signed in until after you have testified. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov slash land use to sign up now. If you are not planning to testify on today's items, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they're recognized to testify. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have written testi testimony, you would like the subcommittee to consider in addition to or in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, or if you require an accessible version of a presentation given at today's meeting, please email land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask that you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Riley will now continue with today's agenda. I now open today's public hearing on LU 889, 890, 891, 892, and 893, the Cooper Park Commons Project. This application was submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation 
and the Development and MassPef Manager LLC, a joint venture of the St. Nick's Alliance, Hudson Companies, and the Project Renewal. The application requests approval of a proposed amendment of the zoning map changing an R6 district to an R7-2 C2-4 district. An amendment of Appendix F of the zoning resolution to designate a mandatory exclusionary housing area. The grant of a special permit pursuant to Section 74-743A2 of the zoning resolution to modify height and setback requirements. The minimum distance between building with a large scale general development. The designation of a property located at 288 Jackson Avenue, block 2008, excuse me, 2885, lot one as an urban development action area, an urban development action area project for such an area and the disposition of such property to a developer selected by HPD and the modification of a prior disposition of a city owned property located at 20 Kingsland Avenue, block 2885, lot 10 to change the permitted community facility use from a healthcare facility to the use of general community facility uses. These actions will facilitate the redevelopment of a 4.5 acre former, excuse me, 4.5 acre former Greenpoint Hospital campus in the East Williams Bridge into Cooper Parks Commons, a mixed use complex with two new buildings and the enlargement of a two of the historic former hospital buildings provided approximately 553 units of affordable and senior housing community facility uses, and light retail, and the on-site replacement of the 200-bed Cleman Residence Homeless Shelter. This project is located in the district represented by Council Member Reynoso. I would like to allow my colleague, Council Member Reynoso, to give some words about this project. Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair Riley, for the opportunity to speak um, in your subcommittee today. Um, I wanna thank all the council members that are on. Um, also want to thank the applicants for coming uh, to this, uh, from being mandated to, but for being here. Thank you for being here. Um, it, it's been a long time. Uh, I'm talking about decades uh, since this hospital was shut down of having an area in our district that was ripe for housing development, um, you know, sit without, um, without development for over 40 years. I think it's 40 years this community has come together and put together a plan that has existed, I wanna say, and they're gonna correct me, the applicants will correct me. They put a plan together 20 years ago for exactly what they wanna see on this site because of politics, this is straight up because of politics, we haven't been able to develop this site and build the very important affordable housing that this community greatly needed 30, 40, 20 years ago. Instead it languished, um, and the community was relegated to extreme gentrification without an opportunity to stay in their homes. Um, but it seems like the politics have changed in North Brooklyn. And because of it, uh, this administration decided that we could move forward with the building of affordable housing. I wanna give you that history because what we're seeing here today is something that's a extremely important um, and extremely like powerful uh, for a community that has been highly gentrified and has seen and hasn't seen a share of uh, affordable housing and assistance from the city related to displacement. We're talking about over 700 units of housing on a city owned site, 100% affordable housing. Of those 200 beds that will be going to homeless, uh, to homeless individuals. We're maintaining, a refer we're maintaining the amount of homeless um, individuals that are in and around this site um, and having a brand new space that is specifically tailored to cater for their needs. Um, then we have over 500 units of affordable housing, of which vary from deeply, deeply affordable to affordable housing. Um, there's no games being played in this site. Uh, there, it, what you see is what you get. It is arguably, um, you know, one of the one of the most affordable. Um, uh, resource-filled, uh, community-based, community-built, community-led uh, housing developments that this city will, will ever see. We're taking this site and we're doing the max. We're doing everything that we can. 
Um, what we're asking here today uh, is for the subcommittee to hear us out. Um, I, I say us because I really feel like this is a partnership between the community, the developer, the community group um, organization that's been helping us in St. Nick's and myself. Um, we've been at this for a long time. So I'm really excited to be where we are. Now, I wanna be honest, I think we, we have so, a little bit of work to do here at the end here. I feel like we're 99% to where we need to get to. Um, uh, but I really want to allow for the developer and the community organization to kind of um, say their piece, uh, do the best they can to present this uh, amazing this amazing application to the subcommittee. I'm hoping when it's all said and done, we can get to a yes um, and move it to, to the 90s committee. Again, I want to thank you, Chair Riley, for giving me an opportunity to um, speak and give some context to how uh, unbelievable this moment is that we're finally here after 40 years. Uh, so again, thank you, Chair, for the for giving me time. So oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I'm just going to Council Member Renoso. I think uh, your testimony uh, really gives me a background of what your community is going to get from this project. And I'm really elated to understand that it was a joint effort uh, with community developers and HPD. So that's really excited to hear. I saw the project and it's going to be very beautiful for your community. So thank you for your leadership. Uh, presented for the applicants, uh, we have Lin Zeng and Aaron Buchanan from HPD, Aaron Kaufman on behalf of the Hudson Companies and Frank Lang on behalf of St. Nick Alliance. We also have the following individuals available to answer questions. Aaron Drinkwater on behalf of DS DSS, Paul Woody from the Project Renewal, Mark Michael O'Hasen, from the Hudson Companies and Joy Moyer from the Magnuson Architecture and Planning. I now ask that the witnesses be unmuted and the council administer the affirmation. Council. Please raise your right hands. Please unmute yourselves if you've not been unmuted. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all uh, council member questions? I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. Thank you. You may begin your presentation. Uh, thank you, council members. Uh, my name is Lin Zhang from uh, the Department of Housing Preservation Development, and we are happy, we're really happy here today um, to reach this milestone to present this wonderful project in sort of East Williamsburg neighborhood, Brooklyn. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as uh, Chair Riley had introduced already, these are the actions that we are seeking today and through this Euler process, which includes urban development action area. So we could convey um, this public property for a greater public use. Um, to a developer, uh, disposition approval, uh, zoning map amendment to allow us to reach the density for the amount of affordable housing that we're proposing on the site, a zoning text amendment so we could also apply mandatory inclusionary housing, and a special permit to allow us to, to get to the envelopes that we are proposing in this rather unusual um, uh, campus. Next slide, please. And here you'll see this is an aerial view of the site and certainly um, Council Member Reynoso is very familiar with. It is the former Greenpoint Hospital campus, uh, which is directly adjacent from Cooper Park, just south of it. And to the north and east of it is the uh, NYCHA campus, Cooper Houses as well. Uh, but it is a site that is close to transit and certainly uh, predominantly sort of residential um, neighborhood to, to the west and manufacturing um, to the east. Next slide, please. 
And here is a project overview that uh, council member Reynoso already sort of alluded to earlier, but um, with the approval of these actions and uh, the implementation of this project, at the end, you know, we'll see more than 550 units of all affordable housing units, which includes uh, senior housing as well. Um, and then on top of that, a new shelter facility. So currently on the site, there is a, a 200 bed uh, shelter and we're going to uh, relocate that to um, one of the buildings which the developer will go into, uh, but a new facility really designed uh, for that purpose. Um, as well as ground floor community facility and commercial uses. Um, and on top of that, as per the special permit that we're seeking, um, there will be more landscape public areas on the campus. Next slide, please. Um, and at this point, I will turn it to Aaron Kaufman. But I think before doing that, I also want to say, you know, this was this was a long project for me too. I remember going to the community board, and I was pregnant with my my daughter, and and I really hope when she graduates from um, from grade school that I could bring her by to this campus and actually see these buildings go up. So I'm I'm personally very invested and in, you know very excited, and I think everybody who's worked on this is as well. So this is a huge milestone and, and thank you for having us today. Um, and now Aaron can walk us through the rest of the slides. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the introduction. And I also uh, <laughs> want to acknowledge uh, my 15 month old daughter who was born during COVID, who I also want to show this to uh, someday. Uh, so maybe we can go together <laughs> when, when the time is right and it feels safe uh, to do so. Um, so thank you, Lynn. Thank you, HPD. Thank you, Chair Riley, uh, for this opportunity. Um, I, it's always nice to be uh, at, at the subcommittee level for ULERP. Uh, it's even nicer when the, the um, council person takes away most of your talking points in, in his or her introduction. So thank you, Council Member Reynoso. It truly has been a partnership. Um, uh, we had a long two hour meeting. It was the last meeting I had in person prior to, to COVID shutting us all down on March 13th in St. Nick's. And- um, hey, I'm uh, sorry, Aaron, can you just identify yourself for the record? Oh, I'm so sorry, I jumped right okay. in. I, I apologize, Chair. Uh, I'm Aaron Kaufman, uh, Managing Principal of the Hudson Companies. Sorry about that. We started talking about babies and I get excited. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, where was I? Oh yes, it's been a real partnership and, and uh, uh, Council Member Reynoso, your leadership, your feedback, your guidance, uh, you put your heart into it as, as you do with everything you do. We've, it, is, it has made this project even better. Um, and I wanna thank you and your staff for their dedication and time. You have a lot on your plate, um, <laughs> about to have even more so, but we really appreciate uh, all the work you've done over the years uh, to help make this project even better. And to your earlier point, um, you know, we are sort of the tip of a 40 year, um, collaboration and evolution of transforming this project. Um, uh, area groups, uh, local stakeholders, of course, Grec, um, have been critical to getting us to this day. And I wanna thank them as well um, for helping to shape what we believe is a, is a project that we all will be proud of. Um, elected officials, city agencies, and of course this development team, but hopefully also our neighbors um, will think this is a great introduction into this wonderful neighborhood. So thank you for that long introduction. And finally, I wanted to thank uh, HPD and Department of City Planning uh, for the thousands of hours that we have spent on making this into a wonderful project. Finally, um, my team is having a bit of uh, issues I'm hearing um, uh, with the Zoom crashing. So bear with us, mine seems fine, but um, a couple of my colleagues who may be speaking may have some issues logging in. If so, I'll try and cover for them. Um, if we don't hear from them, but I just wanted to let you know that's the case. Now on to the project team. Thank you for the <laughs> letting me digress. So St. Nick's has been in the neighborhood since 1975, serving low and middle income families uh, in North Brooklyn, has developed 2,600 units of affordable housing, uh, and has been, of course, of course, a part of the GRAC coalition since the 80s. Hudson has been around since 1986. We got our start actually building affordable housing on um, land that had been seized through in-rem foreclosure by the city 
uh, and became one of the largest um, developers in the new homes program with the housing partnership where we built over 1700 um, uh, uh, units of housing, uh, many in North Brooklyn as well. Um, we have over uh, 3,500 units of affordable housing uh, complete and another 3,200 in the pipeline. Um, and, and we are certainly uh, uh, happy that Cooper Park Commons is a cornerstone of that. Project Renewal is one of the oldest and, and most venerable uh, institutions when it comes to homeless housing and services. They currently offer over 2,000 shelter beds and 1,900 permanent housing units, as well as other services as well. Next slide, please. And as Lynn has alluded to, we now are zooming in from the map here. Here's the area site. So uh, the, the yellow is sort of the super block um, and Cooper Park houses uh, sort of um, uh, lies on the north and eastern side. Um, here's the existing Greenpoint Hospital building. There currently is a DHS shelter uh, being operated there by DHS. Um, this is St. Nick's headquarters here. Can you see my cursor? I'm sorry, Chair. You can, okay. Um, and then, and over here is the existing nurses residence on the Southeast, bound by these orange lines, which is just outside of the urban development area, our neighborhood women's houses, oh, thank you, <laughs> uh, which is developed actually by St. Nick's. So our plan is to fold them in together. So architecturally they work well, but also recreationally they will work well uh, uh, too. The power plant you see here includes a quite a large smokestack that is connected to the hospital building um, that faces uh, uh, Jackson. And we will be tearing that, uh, that part down um, later on in the project. So you can see here, the, and this middle street is Skillman Street. It's, it actually is right now is a closed street to the public. Um, and we are gonna show you how we plan to intervene here to create a more open, welcoming environment for not just the residents, but also the neighbors as well. Next slide, please. So going from there, you can see that we have four buildings um, that we plan. Um, buildings one and three, are, again, are the existing buildings. We are going to reuse them, transform them, preserve them um, into, into housing, um, which I'll get into in a second. Building one, again, an existing building will be a 200 bed homeless shelter run jointly with Project Renewal and St. Nick's. Building two will transform vacant land into a 310 unit all affordable development with some retail community facility. Building three is the existing Greenpoint Hospital. Again, that's where there is a current DHS shelter. Our plan is to move those shelter operations down into building one. And in its place, we will transform the building from the inside only um, into 106 units of senior affordable housing. Finally, building four, uh, where the power plant is, that will be torn down and we'll put up a brand new building of 137 units of affordable housing plus a community and senior facility that will uh, also serve um, Cooper Park houses across the street. And you can see here in our site plan, which we'll get into in a second, we've transformed the, the area to include a lot more greenery, um, places to sit, places to relax, as well as some private uh, recreation spaces as well for the residents. Next slide, please. Here's our affordability mix. Again, this is assuming a family of three at 107,400. Uh, based on 2021 AMI. Building, as we said, building one will be a 200 bed shelter. Building two, 311 units with the super, you can see a mix of incomes going from 30% AMI up to 80% AMI. Building three is the senior building um, with not only 33 formerly homeless units, but also 73 units uh, at or below 50% AMI. This is mainly geared towards social security income. Um, so that we, HPD wants us to underwrite it. I think it's good policy that in the event an individual doesn't have other means besides social security, they're not in a place where they are living in an unaffordable uh, situation. So 73 units below 50% AMI. And then building four, the new building that will take the place of the power plant, will also have units uh, 41 formerly homeless and then units again from 30 to 80% AMI. Total units is 556. More than 50% of the units in building two and four are family units, two and three bedrooms. All units are below 80% AMI. A third of the units are below 50% AMI. And of course, 30% of the units are formerly homeless. Next slide, please. Hi, sweetheart. 
Um, <laughs> I don't know if my colleague Paul Woody is on from Project Renewal. Checking, going once. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Oh, hey, Paul. All right, so Paul will do Hi. the homeless shelter. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Sure, yeah, I mean, I just, I, really quickly, you know, Project Renewal is really excited to be part of this project. Oh, Paul, um, Paul, can you just identify yourself for the record, please? Oh, yes, um, um, my name is Paul Woody. I'm Vice President of Real Estate uh, here at Project Renewal. Thank you. Um, uh, so Project Renewal is excited to be part of this project. Um, like uh, the council member said, um, you know, we're excited to be part of a purpose-built shelter. Um, we've had a hand in, in the design uh, to best serve our clients, our staff, and the community. Um, we pride ourselves in um, having an integrated approach to um, uh, uh, our client care. So we'll have um, healthcare, occupational therapy, housing placement services, um, dedicated outdoor space for clients all within uh, the shelter and um, you know we are committed to working with the community um, and uh, our, take our security very seriously in and around our building. And I'll turn it back over to Aaron at this point. Thank you Paul. Next slide please. You can see we're gonna have a community advisory board a 24-7 security program as well I'm sorry. Um, so now going down to the ground floor, um, you know, we wanted, th this is this is not extending any retail corridor. So we were trying to come up with a plan that services the needs of the community um, and still activates Maspeth mostly, um, as well as Jackson um, in, a, in a smart way. So the, the, the biggest intervention we're doing is a community health clinic, a 5,000 square foot clinic uh, where box one is shown. That's in the Southeast or Eastern part of building two. Uh, there'll be a business and workforce development center that we're putting in um, really in the southern part of, of building two. You can see that's box two. And then there's a small cafe that we hope to just, you know, activate the space to some degree and, and give people a place to grab some coffee and maybe a sandwich um, on the on the southwest part of building two as well. All of these face Maspeth. As you can see, the sidewalk will be will be much wider, um, which we'll get into in a second. So it's important that there are people around just to give it a sense, a good sense of human scale. Um, and then obviously it looks upon the park, which we'll get into in a second. Finally, uh, last but not least, the senior center that I mentioned um, that uh, St. Nick's will be operating for, for both the site and Cooper Park houses across the street, which is another 5,000 square feet. And that'll be at the base of building four. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, you can't create great spaces without creating great opportunities for, for the people that live there. Um, job creation is a critical component um, for this team. Um, St. Nick's will be, is, currently runs a, uh, a job training program uh, that we will be bolstering um, and it will be written into the general contract for each of the buildings and into the subcontracts uh, within the general contract so that it is mandatory that we hire locally, that we support local hiring, um, we support MWBE hiring, not just through Hire NYC, but through our own initiatives. Uh, it's not, we're not trying to reach some percentage. We're trying to, you know, do everything we can, go beyond that. Uh, Hudson has certainly done that on other projects that were publicly owned um, in the Bronx mostly, and also in East New York uh, in Council Member Barron's district, uh, where we exceeded our own um, local and MWBE hiring. This will be no different. In fact, I think we're even gonna do better when one of our partners runs one of those programs. Um, there'll be community open spaces, you can see. We'll have public open spaces throughout the campus, um, bringing in new trees, shading, lighting, um, cameras uh, coming in to the areas you know, that, that, that are in between the buildings. And of course, sustainability, we will be building to a passive house standard. Hudson currently uh, has the largest passive house building in the world at Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island. Um, that's about to be surpassed by Jonathan Rose um, at Sendero Verde, but we are taking our knowledge and putting it into building passive house buildings for the new buildings. The existing buildings will be built to lead gold, to reduce low uh, emissions and improve air quality, which we all know um, can trend towards the lower income neighborhoods in our city. So where we can do our part, we will. Um, Hudson also proudly uh, in Council Member Barron's district uh, had at one point the largest multifamily solar uh, photovoltaic array system in the state of New York at Gateway Elton. Um, so we know solar well, we'll be putting those on buildings two and four. And then we will, as, as we've all now experienced most recently uh, with Hurricane Ida, 
um, already are keyed in towards an expansive neighborhood stormwater retention system where we'll have detention tanks and, and, and retention cisterns um, and places where we can hold water back from going into the sewer during a rain event, let that trickle back into the system slowly uh, once the clouds literally part. So um, it's, it's super important that we have empowerment here, that we have sustainability and we have resiliency as we bring these buildings to fruition. Next slide. And here are some views. So this is, uh, this is on MassBeth looking uh, basically past the eastern part of building two. So the glass area that you're seeing on the ground floor there, that would be the community health center. Um, looking beyond that is the existing Greenpoint Hospital. So we tried to take the color hues from the hospital and apply them to the new buildings. And the color hue off the palette obviously matches building one, the shelter, which we'll be preserving, which is there on the right side. Next slide. Uh, here is an axon view, basically as if we were a drone over Cooper Park looking northwest. Uh, so that's building one there. The 200 bed shelter is the, is the C-shaped building you're seeing there in the southeast corner of the block. Building two is the large new building with solar panels and recreation space for the tenants. Building three is the existing hospital that you see there with the arched windows. And building four is looking north towards Cooper Park houses. Next slide, please. Um, and this is uh, looking southeast from Jackson Street. So these are the neighborhood women's buildings that are owned by St. Nick's. Um, so this basically shows you the front of building four um, where the smokestack is. Uh, so that uh, you can see there is, is a mid-rise building with the taller building two in the background looking southeast. Um, and St. Nick's headquarters basically is in the, is in the right side there uh, on the corner. Actually, no, it's further down the block now that I think about it, it's further down the block. Next slide. Yeah, so going back to this private recreation idea. So you're looking right now at uh, the Eastern part of buildings three and four, um, and this is the neighborhood women's building. So essentially right now there's some fencing there um, in, in partnership with St. Nick's. And one of the benefits of course, of having this partnership with St. Nick's, we're gonna take these fencings, fences down and basically activate new recreation space for the existing residents of the neighborhood women's building, essentially on the Northeast corner of Jackson and Deba Voice, and bringing this lawn in here, that, that's all private just for the residents of three and four and the current residents of the neighborhood women's building. I believe we could also have uh, the, the rest of the tenants there, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's sort of enclosed in a nice natural way on a lower scale. You can see you know, the buildings are not that high brings in a lot of light and air and, and should be a wonderful amenity for the residents there. Next slide. This is a view from Cooper Park. Um, yes, you can see here, this is the, the bulk of building two and um, what will become the shelter there on the right with building three and four there through the alley um, looking, uh, going north. Um, and you can see how the, how the buildings work with, with the park across the street. Next slide. So, uh, you know, we, we've had some really good conversations both with um, Council Member Reynoso, his staff, as well as uh, City Council Land Use. I want to thank them too for, for the many hours we've spent together trying to, you know, make, make important tweaks. I think that that will make the project even better. One of them is the bulk of Building 2 and, I, and the feedback we heard um, was was important and and what we've tried to do instead um, so uh, if you just I'm sorry if you could just back up one slide please there so you can see there it was trying to break up this bulk massing here of building two this is the existing one this is what was in our proposal and what we've been working on and then next slide please this is how we've chosen to, to or propose breaking up the blocks um, uh, that face Massbeth and face Cooper Park. So it's just a nice, easy delineation. I, I, I actually, we, we really like it actually. I think this, is, this was a great pivot that we did um, to, to break up the blocks. I think it makes it even more interesting. We didn't lose one affordable unit, which was important, I think, to everybody. 
um, and, and gives it a nice facade on both the west and southern sides. Next slide. I believe that is it. Uh, we are happy to have, answer any questions. And again, we thank you for the time and the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron, Lynn, uh, and, and Paul. Uh, I think like you, I'm going to be visiting this uh, with my children. It's going to be a beautiful complex. Um, but I do have a few questions. Um, large portions of the Greenpoint Hospital site have been vacant for decades. Why has it taken HPD in the city so long to advance a development proposal at this site? Um, I could try. <laughs> I could try to answer that. Um, I think with any planning project, any development project in the city, it's going to take a long time. Um, but this is, uh, but this site, like a lot of city-owned sites, has a story past, um, and so I think you know. I think which had to do with um, what the community wanted to see. And, and, and I think eventually um, when we started the RFEI process about six years ago, um, we really, HPD really took it upon ourselves to, to go out to the community multiple times to do workshops, um, get input, put out an RFEI and to identify a project and a developer that could deliver the project that the community wants to see. And I think um, I think in terms of affordability here um, and maximizing the number of units we could get on the site was definitely something that um, a lot of groups in the community um, signed on to and agree with. Um, so, so, I mean, I've only been HPD for eight years, so I can't really speak to what happened before then, um, but here we have a great opportunity for underutilized sites um, for a use that clearly the city doesn't have enough of. So, um, so I, I, I don't know if that answers your question. How did HPD determine the target number of affordable housing units? Um, this was for the developers and their submissions to submit. Um, and we worked with DCP in identifying a bulk that is acceptable, that has good land use rationale, design rationale. Um, but we obviously did not want to leave any um, affordable units um, off the table that we could actually fit here that is in an appropriate scale. Um, so that's that's how we got to the number. It wasn't, it wasn't a number that we put in the RFP to say you have to hit the certain number, but certainly we wanted, we wanted the project to maximize and optimize what they can get without, you know, um, without compromising other things like um, light and air and, and stuff like that. This plan calls for construction of a very large new building in close proximity to the occupied existing buildings. Does the development team have a plan for ensuring that construction does not adversely affect the existing shelter and affordable housing residents on site? Um, yes, I mean, because it is a taller building, we're required by DOB to put in um, additional safety measures, have additional site safety staff, submit a site safety plan and a site logistics plan. All of that has to be approved, I think, by DOB and DOT um, before we can get DOB approvals. So we will follow their guidelines. Uh, we will hire appropriately, of course, and, um, and even through, throughout construction, uh, we'll constantly monitor how things are going um, and work with Community Board One and uh, elected officials to, you know, ad address any issues that may come up as we're as we move through construction. Chair, Chair Riley, if I may, uh, my name is Frank Lang. I'm the director of housing for St. Nick's Alliance. Um, we're the uh, property manager for the four residential buildings on the site, as well as the our headquarters, which is. Uh, on, on the corner adjacent to the first building and the four residential buildings, which are nearer to the second phase, which would be buildings three and four. So we've been uh, very involved to keep residents who live in our properties, as well as the residents in the homes down the block and the residents of Cooper Park houses across the street constantly involved. And they will continue to be involved all through the construction, which will take about eight years to finish the entire project. So 
it's part of how we're going to do that. And, and the concerns on environmental noise and dust are very much in, in, uh, taken into consideration beyond what DOB or DOT would even uh, require. Thank you, Frank. What is the timeline for the four phases of development? And in what year will this project be fully completed? Yeah, I, um, sorry, I'm, okay. Um, you know, our, our goal is to close on the, we, we got OMB approval already, um, which is not the last step, but is an important step to registering the contract. Our goal is to close on the shelter financing building one in the spring. Ideally, we close on building two shortly thereafter with HPD uh, and likely HDC. And then it feels like building Four will be, you know, building three would come along uh, sometime later. Uh, we can't work on building three until building one is done because we want to take the population out of three and put it into one. So in a, I think optimistically 2027 um, is when we're looking at finishing, uh, but, but could, could be, you know, 2028. 2027, 2028, Aaron, are we, are we saying 2028 is the, I, I, <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's a little difficult with the, with the mayoral administration handing, uh, handing its reins over. Um, you know, we want, we obviously want to be in the pipeline whenever we're ready. And, you know, unfortunately the reality is there's still so much demand for affordable housing that sometimes, you know, every wonderful deserving project doesn't get slotted in right away. Um, so I'm, I'm just being more realistic <laughs> um, that, that 2028 feels like the right finish line. Um, um, but you know, I, it might be a year. I don't think it could be any earlier than 27. And I, that's, I feel, I'm just going to say 2028. 20, Let's just call it 28. <laughs> yeah, let's hope that is earlier than that. I hope so too, <laughs> sir. <laughs> it's better for everybody. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, much of the proposed publicly accessible open space is taken up by vehicle driveways and parking. Has the development team considered alternate programming for parts of the open space, such as a playground, which is very important, or additional passive green space for the community? We have, um, and we've been, oh, sorry. No, I just, I think that it's, it's actually not accurate that most of the space is taken up by drive. Um, it's maybe confusing because the pedestrian uh, walkway of Skillman Avenue is currently a DMAP street and is currently used by DHS for parking trucks and other vehicles. But in reality, that's going to be a wonderful pedestrian thorough, you know, boulevard. It's going to be wonderful for people to walk. And um, there's a, then there will be a connecting uh, passage, walking passage to Maspeth Avenue. So in fact, the amount of drive in the, in the site is very limited. If, if we were to go back to the site plan, you would see there is a small part that has some vehicular passage, but we are in conversation with uh, the council land use staff, as well as the council member to look at that. Um, I think it's also incumbent to remember there is a public park across the street with a with an active playground. We are providing a playground for uh, building number two in the in the open space in that for that building. So, and there's a roof terrace, and there's going to be other play areas. So, I just um, I I think it's not um, characterizing the 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 plan as if it's vehicular access, it's actually very limited vehicular access. And it's really about human access, which right now, when you walk around the campus, it kind of feels like a prison because you have this fence that goes all around it. And it becomes this object that people have to circumnavigate. Whereas going forward, people will be able to walk down Skillman and it will be a delightful way to get to Cooper Park houses. And the residents in the, in the community, um, the resident council of Cooper Park Houses are really looking forward to what we've done in the design. Thank you, Frank. 
Um, and just one more question. I, I know we talked about public safety. Uh, Paul, Paul briefly touched upon it. Can you go into more detail about the security uh, measures that you're going to be taking on site? Uh, will these securities be armed? How many security guards will be on shift? Um, it, can you just go into a little bit more detail um, if you have that detail now? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to the to the shelter, um, uh, and and the rest of the team can can pick up the rest of the campus. But you know, so Project Renewal has a director of security that oversees security at all our shelters. Um, one of the nice things about uh, this shelter being purpose built is that we've been able to be really thoughtful about um, uh, closed uh, closed circuit cameras inside the facility and and um, outside. Um, to make sure that we can monitor safety um, appropriately. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure how many security guards will be assigned uh, to, to every shift here, but there'll be 24 seven security for sure. Um, and um, and we, our director of security also works very closely with um, local precincts um, and, um, and, uh, and yeah, we take it very seriously. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Council, I'm going to go to my colleagues to see if there's any questions. But before I begin, I just want to say we've been joined by Council Member Miller. Uh, Council, uh, I see uh, Council Member Barron has a question. Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the panel for being here to talk about this project. Uh, during the panel testimony, reference was made to East New York and the projects that were done by Hudson in East New York. And those projects, in fact, were initiated by my predecessor and soon to be successor, uh, my husband, Charles Barron. And it's been an ongoing kind of project that we've worked with. And we had excessive, well, I don't wanna say excessive because you can't have excessive. We've had abundant community input in the projects that resulted. And they also have been projects that have been long time in being designed. So we're glad to have had that relationship and it's ongoing and it gets shaped and molded as we continue to go forward. But I do have a couple of questions about the AMI. I'd like to know what is the AMI of the neighborhood of that specific community where this is being built, not the city AMI, but what is the AMI of that community? For um, example, East New York, the AMI is about $37,000 for a family of three. Right. right. So uh, this is fr Frank again from St. Nick's. So I, I'd have to look at the recent census, but in general, uh, Williamsburg is quite the stratified community. We have both uh, a, a great deal of upper income particularly newer residents moving in, which have skewed some of the uh, median income numbers for uh, Community Board One in Greenpoint and Williamsburg. At the same time, we have, you know, St. Nick's has developed 2,600 units uh, throughout the area. Um, we have a lot of very low income people who, um, if they live in public housing or in one of our developments or colleague developments, are still here. So we have quite the stratified. Um, I would hate. I would say it's higher than East New York uh, because all the development that East New York is challenged to look at in terms of market rate development happened or began 15, 20 years ago in Williamsburg, and so we have that accelerated. Um, but I can get that to the council staff. Uh, I don't have that at the top of my head right now, the AMI median is. But the skewing to your, to understand the, um, the AMIs that we were targeting, um, the community groups that St. Nick's has been a part of for 40 years were very interested to make sure that this was 100% affordable and they were happy that there were some units above the tax credit 60% AMI amount because there's a lot of um, children of residents who, can't, who got driven out of the neighborhood because they don't qualify uh, anymore 
but right. they can't afford the market rate. So we tried yeah. to have that, that skewing mm -hmm. and that's where we came up with the AMRs. Okay, um, well, as you referred to East New York and you made references to market rate, I just have to say for the record that that rezoning that took place is not in my portion of East New York, that's the Northern portion. And I'm very pleased to say that for the last um, 16 years, all of the housing that has gotten public subsidies that has come into our portion of the East New York has not included any market rate. So I just wanna put that on the record. Um, and in terms of the um, AMI, I think I, the chart that I saw said about 150 odd units of the 500 units were at 80, between 60 and 80%. Is that about what it was? That, that's about right, yeah. I mean, we can go back to the chart if, if the council wishes to look at it. Okay, and then just finally, um, I'm trying to be clear on the portion of the housing that you are building that is for so-called formerly homeless. And I'm trying to understand in addition to housing, that category that we call formerly homeless, are you going to have an additional housing unit for homeless, for those who are in shelters? Well, there's going to be the 200 bed shelter that will continue on the site that now operated by DHS now will be operated by Project Renewal in the new facility. But out of the permanent housing, there will be 30% of the units for individuals and families coming from the homeless system. Okay, you know? I, I thought that's what you were saying. Right. And I just wanted to share uh, with this body, with this audience, and as much as I can get this message across the city, New York City has a responsibility to yes, build housing for those who are presently in shelter and move them out of temporary shelter and put them into permanent housing. And I wanna just cite uh, a model of what we've done here in East New York. And I, I offered as a prototype. Help Homes operated a, a square block, four-sided uh, four uh, establishment for shelters. They decided that they wanted to build permanent housing and they wanted to build 300 permanent units and they wanted to have 100 supportive units and 100 shelter units. The community said, heck no, it's not happening. We're not gonna have it. And of course, being of that like mind and being the representative, I did not support that project. There was much negotiations that took place and what we finally had submitted and approved was that there would be no shelters at all, no shelter units in that. Those same people that had been in their initial plan in a own, in, again, in that separate building, which is interesting, you know, a separate unit for them, not interspersed, but a separate unit for them, we're now going to have permanent apartments within that development so that now all 500 units would be permanent housing for people in various uh, categories of income levels. And I would like to, well, that's because our community said, no, we weren't going to approve it. So was there any statement made about another shelter or continuing an existing shelter? Was there any discussion about that? And again, I would like to offer the model that we have for wide consideration that you include those units as permanent apartments for people who are in shelter so that they will no longer be in shelter. And in fact, these 700 units will all be permanent units that are renting, rented to people in various unit sizes and incomes. Um, uh, you know, I, I would say uh, having, having gone through many tumultuous conversations uh, <laughs> amongst the local groups about this. 
one of the realities is that the building that we're using, that we're converting, I should say, to the shelter is really not useful as permanent housing. It works as a shelter because there are open wards where you can have the beds. It's a single men's shelter. It's for single men. And it works very well. And it will be a modern, well, well, uh, well just designed. Just to jump in quickly, because I have a ribbon cutting at 11 o'clock. Yeah, sure. With our technology in the 21st century, it may not, in its present configuration and construction, be, a, be appropriate. But certainly, we can knock down the interior or redesign the interior or move walls and make it appropriate. So uh, that argument to me doesn't reflect our level of sophistication and adaptation for, for construction. I would say that the community, if in the future, we don't need that as a shelter, the community would welcome it. Uh, but that was not part of the consideration at the time. And, um, you know, and I think there is a connection so that as Project Renewal is trying to work with those individuals to get them to a position where they can live independently in, a, in, a, in permanent housing, hopefully many of them will be able to stay on campus and be able to be in the housing that we're creating as well. So um, that would be how we're trying to look at it. Thank you. I just wanted to share that uh, earth no, shadow I... model that we were able to get implemented and put it about and let all of my colleagues know and see perhaps, you know, we never know. Council member Reynoso said there's still negotiations that are taking place. So <laughs> we don't know what that final product is going to be, but I do have to go to ribbon cutting and council member uh, Miller. It's in your old district. We're opening, we're ribbon cutting for an outdoor senior fitness hub in the pink houses. So I'm a little delayed, but thank you very much. And thank you to the chair. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Uh, Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair Riley. Um, and I want to thank Council Member Barron for, for her comments. Um, always very thorough and involved in um, you know, what she believes, you know, the housing, the housing fight is about. She's somebody that's always been present. So I really appreciate her her opinion and her comments. Um, I do want to I want to talk about a couple of things there. 30% um, of the units are going to formerly, formerly homeless uh, people in, in this project. So I want to be like, I think the number right now by law is we have to at least have 10% and we're at 30%. So we're talking about housing people and making sure that we get them housed. This project is absolutely going to do that. Um, but I'm also like, I want to talk about the shelter. Um, by law, by charter mandate, we have to house every single person in the city of New York, every single night. Um, and unfortunately, not every single person in the city of New York has housing. Um, and we're, look, I've worked very hard and I wanna to continue to work hard to get there. Um, and I'm gonna keep fighting to make sure we get there. But till we do, we need to have places where people can go. Um, and Community Board One is, has become a very gentrified and affluent district and shouldn't exempt itself from building of, afford, of, of, of shelter housing or having shelter beds. Um, look, I've done my part since I've been a council member. I've taken on countless shelters. Um, I've built affordable housing, so I'm trying to do it all. Uh, but I don't want to dismiss the value of, of, of homeless shelters as, as a negative thing. Um, I actually think it's a positive thing. And we have a responsibility to the city, to these people, to make sure that they're housed appropriately. So just want to say, we have a current shelter on site. Um, we are building housing for formerly sheltered people and we're keeping a shelter, right? We're doing it all. So we're not, I don't want to have this impression that we're keeping the homeless shelter and not building for homeless people. We're doing both and it is not mutually exclusive. You can have an affordable housing project that is going to assist us in reducing the number of people in homeless shelters while also having a homeless shelter on board. Um, the problem we have with the current nursing is a nursing home residence that is a nursing residence for nurses <laughs> that we're trying to convert into a homeless shelter the community cares deeply about this this uh like a historical landmark i guess they love the building itself the physical building so we weren't allowed through this community-based process to tear it down so it didn't make any sense to have you know what put 
15, 20 apartments inside this building, um, which is, you know, bang for buck just doesn't make any sense, makes the project a lot more expensive when we can house 200 beds for homeless people. So because we couldn't tear it down, which I wanted to do, by the way, Chair Riley, I want to be clear. I wanted to tear it all down and rebuild the whole thing because we could get a thousand units of housing. But this is a community-based process. We need a, a lot of voices need to be heard and we need to make sure we satisfy as many of those voices as possible. So because we wanted to preserve the shelter, the, the nursings, the nursing housing, um, we ended up having that be the homeless shelter. We maintained our, our, our social and moral responsibility of making sure that people are housed while also allowing for a future where those people can get apartments in this site. Um, so it's 700 people are going to be living on this campus, over 700. And of that, one third are going to be in affordable housing and the other 200 of that, which we can argue is another third or 60% of this project is for homeless people one way or another. Um, so I want to do this. So I want to just say that um, homeless, homeless shelters all day. Uh, I'm cool with it. Um, but I do want to say this part is the, the open space uh, portion is something that does bother me. And I want to make sure that it's on record. Um, it's just not enough of it. We have a park across the street, which I'm very grateful for because it means that these residents are going to have a parkside view, which is awesome and usually poor people are looking into like industrial complexes or so forth um we don't see waterfronts we don't see you know parks this is going to be a park front property um so in itself is going to be a great experience for the tenants that are there um but on site considering the 700 people that are going to be living on this campus in this this project i think that the open space is inadequate um i want to be honest if we take out all the parking and we, um, and we don't allow for vehicles to move through this campus, I still think it's insufficient open space, right? But you have to prioritize between affordable housing and open space. Unfortunately, we can't do both on this site. It's just not large enough. And I don't wanna sacrifice any affordable housing for, for open space, even though they're both very important to me, but we just can't do both. Um, but with the small amount of open space we do have, Overall, I want to be able to maximize it. So I have, I do have issues. No matter you know, the presentations put before me by the development team, I just don't think the parking is necessary still to this day. I also think that this street that we've opened up um, and is demapped should just be a, exclusively a pedestrian space and nothing else. No vehicle should ever have to run through that. Only bikes and people. Um, uh, it's how I feel. It's what I believe. Um, because of the lack of affordable of, of open space, uh, we have a housing development across the street in Cooper Park Houses that is a smaller massing than these buildings and has a ton of open space. Um, and this doesn't reflect that. This is a larger project with less open space, just taking away from the aesthetics of this project. So that is a concern for me that I just will not move away from. I'm grateful for the facade changes that have been made by the applicant because I think the building is too bulky. I think it doesn't have, I think design wise that actually helped it significantly by making it feel like separate buildings, by not making it feel like it's just one block, um, you know, like Lego blocks without any variation. So I'm grateful to the facade changes um, to a degree, I still have design issues, but we're not gonna go back to the drawing board. So with that said, should we be able to figure out something that expands the amount of open space on this project, um, no matter what it is? Um, the facade changes being made, I think are appropriate and actually solve for a problem that I've been fighting against for a while. Because I want to be able to look at this project. I, had a, I have a 10-month-old a baby. Uh, and everybody's talking about their babies. I want them to go back and see it too, but I want it to be... I want to. I want people to see it, and it'd be something that we could be proud of, and that it's not just a bulky building that just had no character, that just had no presence. And it's just like we're just throwing poor people in, in warehousing poor people, right? Like I want it to have flavor. I want it to be something that people walk to. You know, they're proud of their buildings, and that happens with design. And I just was very concerned about the lack. I thought the lack of design effort here 
and, and almost like the design effort was to put as many people into these buildings as possible, as opposed to the design effort being aesthetically pleasing to the people that are gonna be living on this site. Um, so I don't know if any of those are questions, but I guess uh, open space is still a concern for me. Design wise, I think we're fine. Um, the affordable housing portions and ranges are great. Um, and I don't wanna use the Williamsburg AMI for this site because then we would have to put everything at 100% AMI because the gentrification and the affluence has made it so that uh, the affordable housing, the, the AMI in Williamsburg is completely out of whack, like, uh, like uh, Frank Lang mentioned. Um, so I don't wanna use that. I wanted to focus on the pockets of poverty and their AMIs and this project is reflective of those AMIs. Um, so outside of that, um, that's where I am. Uh, so I don't know if any applicant, um, if Frank, if you want to go through it one more time, because we, <laughs> we beat this to like, we're blue in the face. It's just that I want you to come. I want to, I want to allow you not to agree, but to see the perspective of a project that is 700 people and that this parking, the park, not the parking, the park is insignificant, is insufficient, regardless of what we do. We can make the whole thing grass, every open space portion grass, and it's still an insufficient amount of space for the amount of people coming in. So when we look at parking, when we look at the street that might allow for vehicular movement, no matter how light it is, it's a concern for me. Uh, and that's it, that's, the, that's my biggest concern at the moment. Um, outside of that, we've, we've done everything else behind closed doors um, or not behind closed doors, but with the community. To, to get what we want. So I'm very happy. Oh, and I'm sorry. And Chair Riley, I do want to talk a little bit about the history of this project because you asked why it took so long. Um, and I want to be straightforward with you about why it took so long. Uh, the housing chair of the state government was Vito Lopez. Vito Lopez wanted this to be disposed to his organization called Richard Bushwick back in the day. And HPD, in an effort to curry favor with the state chair of housing, decided to dispose of the property without an RFP to Richard Bushwick to develop. Um, the community was very upset about that uh, because they had no say in who the developer was. There was no RFP, there was no process. This is just HPD doing the political bidding of a very powerful individual, then county chair. Um, so once we were able to fight that, um, the project was held back and I believe Bloomberg believed that it was too politically uh, toxic for him to get involved, but de Blasio took it on and was like, we could start working on it um, now that it seems like the politics are out of the way. Um, an RFP was done um, and in the RFP, uh, HPD has preference, preference that they give to any adjacent property owners of the site. And St. Nick's Housing, not only he manages and owns the properties, that are on the site in the neighborhood women housing and also has their offices adjacent to it right next door on the left. So across the board and St. Nick's has been doing that work. St. Nick's is also a member of GREC, which was part of the original design team and the neighborhood group that kind of came up with the idea of what they want to see moving forward. Um, Vito Lopez lost his seat because of sexual harassment claims at the state level um, and has uh, since passed away. Um, because the political force is no longer there, um, HPD and the administration found it prudent to start moving forward with building affordable housing for this community. So I just want you to know that 40 years, politics held it back, nothing more than politics. Um, and now HPD um, has come forward. And in the seven years that we've been planning, we've come up with something amazing. Again, I wish it was something we could have done 20 years ago, but we're getting it done now. Um, so thank you all for giving me the opportunity uh, to lengthily speak on on these issues and want to thank everybody again that's here thank you council member Reynoso. council member miller council member miller you have your hand raised can can you hear me now yes yes we can hear you Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to my, my colleague, uh, uh, Councilmember Reynoso, for his in-depth uh, uh, engagement in, in this, in this uh, particular project. Uh, I see your passion um, in this, and, and obviously, 
uh, really understand needs and values of, of, of the Williamsburg uh, community. Um, I do have one question that you, uh, it's about something that you brought up during the RFP process. It's something that I was not aware of that um, there was a preference uh, uh, given to uh, uh, property owners um, by HBD in, in the process um, and, and uh, what that means, not just to uh, opportunities um, and, and uh, diversity of, of, of the project, but also the diversity and opportunity for MWBEs to get involved if in fact they are not uh, uh, those property, current property owners on MWBEs. Um, I, I guess that's an that's a HBD question, um, but it's certainly something that would concern me considering that uh, MWBEs are newly arriving uh, to, to, to the affordable housing uh, industry and not likely to be the existing uh, neighbor of, of, of properties um, that are being developed. Could HPD speak to that? I, I'm sorry, council member, can you, can you clarify that question? Um, you're asking about our RFP process, our selection yes. process? Is there, is there actually a preference uh, for uh, property owners of adjacent properties that go up uh, next to a, a property that, uh, that RFP has been uh, issued? Sure. Um, so I, um, I want to be on the record. I wasn't around when when HPD, um, you know, deeded the land or um, designated the land for Vito Lopez's preference. Um, so certainly, since my time at HPD, what we've tried to do is to hold a competitive process for all of our public sites, and especially for a public site with significant size and um, impact. We definitely want to pick and have the best project, meaning a development team that has done a project of this size and scope, um, a design that is of highest quality um, and an affordability that meets the needs of the community. So, so that is how we generally do business these days is to put out an RFP after extensive outreach with the local community so that we can have the best project on the site. Um, in terms of what you um, refer to adjacent owners, um, there are instances, and they're really rare, uh, where we have small pieces of pro property scattered across the city. And, you know, and if there is an owner who could contribute land um, and would make the project on the city sites more affordable or, you know, better for the public, um, benefit the public in, in more of a, its capacity than the land itself that the city has, then we would consider it. But that is really on really like a small amount. So, so I think what you're, what you mostly see. So, so in this HPD, particular case, in this particular case, how much of a consideration were they given uh, uh, in, in compared to the other uh, respondents to the RFP? There, the adjacency was not. I, I, I do understand that there are, that there are, you know, if in fact, you know, uh, I, I see situations if, 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 if a project was able to be a, a, a ongoing project was going to be expanded by the purchase of another property that you give preference to the owner of that property if, or if the developers able to purchase that property that there's some assistance in there. Um, but it, it seems to me that if a project already exists um, and not ongoing to just, you know, is it about the continuity of the project that I, I'm, I'm not understanding why. I mean, in this case, yeah. this was the best project submitted for all the reasons that I listed um, is development of the capacity St. Nick's a tie to the community. So them being a really fantastic community partner and for their designs. So, you know, and, and unfortunately I can't disclose all the other respondents here. Um, so that is um, not something I, I can do, but this project was selected and we hope that you enjoyed the presentation was because it was the best project that was submitted. Council, Council oh. Member Miller, this is uh, Frank Lang. 
Um, again, I don't know how HPD made their decision, but um, I will certainly say that our design followed the community vision that HPD went through um, a process and most of the input that it got prior to the RFEI was from community residents. And, and I would say, because we know the community and because we do have the properties adjacent, our design was probably more inclusive and more comprehensive, but I would not say that it was because we, had, we had the adjacent properties that that's why we got it. I would say it's because we have a very strong team and because our project really was um, the most responsive to what the city wanted and uh, needed for the site. I hear you, that's what you would say, but uh, MWBE who shares needs and values of those communities, I would think that they would articulate that they were equally um, as qualified uh, to 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 develop this, this this project yes, as well. I would agree. I would agree. But in the design, I'm just saying about our design. I'm not. I'm not as trying to cast any aspersions on anybody else's qualifications. I don't want to do that. You know, I don't know who the other respondents were, uh, if any of them were MWBs. Uh, so this, in this, this particular this case, about, this is just about the process and HPD. Yes. So, so I, yeah. I understand. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Council members certainly appreciate uh, uh, your efforts in putting this uh, and your due diligence. I know what it's like to, to work on a project for such a length and, and see it uh, begin to come to fruition. So thank you. That, that's, that's, that's my question. Thank you, uh, Councilman Miller. And I would love to catch up with you uh, to, to talk to you about my experience on this one and how the adjacent stuff worked. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Councilmember Dharma Diaz. Good morning. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I just want to come directly to Councilmember Reynoso. Thank you for moving this project forward as a little one that was born in, in Cumberland Hospital, you know, watching the, for years, driving by and watching the area underutilized. It's definitely a happy moment for me to know that we're moving forward in a positive direction. Also, thank you for your passionate conversation in reference to homeless individuals. For those who work also that work the shelter, like we call a temporary um, displaced, which is really what it is. You know, in closing, thank you for remembering that housing is a human right. And thank you all for the dedication, HPD as well, and the advocates. I can't thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Homelessness obviously is a big deal for me. And to know that you moved up the digits is pretty impressive. Thank you. I'm looking forward to, to seeing the, the curtains go up. Thank you. Thank you, Darman. I just want to say I was born in Cumberland Hospital, too. So we have something in, com in common. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> that is what. Well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Darman Diaz. Thank you uh, for your testimony to the panel. Uh, there being no more council member questions, this panel is excused. Thank you very much. There are uh, two members of the public who have signed up to testify on this item. They are Paul Kelterborn and Thaddeus Briner. If you could please admit them and unmute them now. Mr. Kelterborn, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you very much. I'm testifying on behalf of Friends of Cooper Park, a community organization focused on advocacy and stewardship of the park directly across the street from the proposed development. Cooper Park is a very heavily used and beloved neighborhood park. Alongside other organizations in the area and as part of GREC, 
Friends of Cooper Park has been requesting safety improvements to the streets in the neighborhood for many, many years. With Carrig Montessori School on Olive Street, the open street on Sharon, and the many children and families on Mass Beth at Cooper Park houses and in our neighborhood generally, we deserve streets that deprioritize moving cars and instead support our safety and a healthy environment. With the redevelopment of the hospital and the addition of hundreds of new households to the neighborhood, we request that the, that, the, that the New York City Council demand a firm commitment from the DOT as part of any approval to address and remedy our longstanding traffic concerns. In particular, safety improvements and the traffic signal at the corner of Olive and Mass Beth and at the corner of Cooper Park, safety improvements and a traffic signal at the corner of Kingsland and Mass Beth, traffic calming on both Kingsland and Mass Beth, and a comprehensive redesign of the treacherous intersection where Wood Point meets Consellier, Mass Beth, and Bushwick. In addition, while any amount of new public open space will be welcomed by our community, the northwest corner of the site plan by Kingsland and Jackson is dominated by a proposed new driveway and surface parking, which takes up a significant amount of space. In this day and age of climate crisis, it doesn't seem right to be building any new surface parking. This could be an opportunity to weave even more generous pedestrian and green space into the development. Safe streets and access to public space are essential for the many families that visit Cooper Park in our growing residential community. We urge the city council to see that these concerns are addressed as part of any large scale rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelterborn. Um, Taddeus Briner, if you could please accept the promotion request that has come to you through Zoom so you can enter the meeting. Mr. Briner, are you ready to begin? The committee should stand at ease for 30 seconds while we resolve this. Uh, I have requested that uh, Mr. Briner accept an invitation to be promoted to a panelist and he's declined that invitation. So we can move on. Seeing no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on LU 889, 890, 891, and 892. 892 and 893 are now closed and the items are laid over. Council, um, at this let's go ahead. At this time, I'd like to record Council Member Miller's vote on the items we voted on earlier. Council Member Miller, how do you vote on LUs 828 and 835? Uh, could, could you go through those items again for me? LU 828 is the Dorrance Brooks Historic District, and LU 835 is 101 Barrick Avenue. Vote aye. Thank you. The vote is four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and with zero abstentions. And as noted earlier, the items are recommended to the Foley Land Use Committee. Thank you, Council. Next, I open the public hearing on LU number 848, 849, 850, and 851 related to the Glenmore Manor Project. 
submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, these applications request approval of the amendment to zoning map section 17C and 17D, changing from an R6 district to an R7A slash C2-4 district, and changing from an R6 district to an R7D slash C2-4 district. Amendment of the zoning resolutions modifying Appendix F to designate a mandatory exclusionary housing area. Designation of an urban development action area. Approval of an urban development action area project for such area. And approval of the disposition of property located at 305-309 Mother Gaston Boulevard. 46-64 Christopher Avenue and 111-117 Glenmore Avenue to a developer of HPD's choosing and approval of the third amendment to the Brownsville's to urban renewal plan to change the designation of site 11B from public institutional to use to residential use. The proposed action will facilitate the development of Glenmore Manor, an 11-story mixed-use building with approximately 232 affordable housing units and 18,600 square feet of commercial and community space as an entrepreneurial hub for local businesses and nonprofit incubations. The project site is located in Brooklyn Council District, represented by Council Member Dharma Diaz. And now I'd uh, like to allow my colleague, Council Member Dharma Diaz, to give some uh, words on this project. Council Member Dharma Diaz. Good morning. I just thank you for thank you, Chair, for hearing of the project today and for all that support in, in line for this project, the Bronzeville plan to come into fruition. As the chair stated, it's 232 units, of which 60 units are going to go toward formerly homeless individuals. Again, I'm, I'm eager for the community to hear about our Bronzeville plan and what we look forward to bringing to the community. I turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Dharma Diaz. Uh, looking forward to this project in your community. Uh, presented for the applicants, we have Lynn Zeng and Makita Marshall Nismith from HPD and Erica Keller from Brissa Builder Corporation. I now ask that these witnesses be unmuted or they unmute themselves and that council administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hands and state your names. Erica Keller. Lynn Zhang. Makita Marshall Nismith. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. I do. Thank you so much, ladies. You may begin with your presentation. Thank you. Um, is the presentation up? bringing up now, just one okay, moment. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Makita Marshall Neesmith and I am a Brooklyn planner. I am the Brooklyn planner for Glenmore Manor. Lynn Zhang, director of Brooklyn planning is also in this meeting and we are joined by members of the development team. We are here to share with you Glenmore Manor, which is a project designated through the Brownsville RFP. Next slide, please. Thank you. Glenmore Manor was certified by the City Planning Commission on April 19, 2021. HPD is seeking the land use, these land use actions listed to support the development of Glenmore Manor. The sponsor team or development team consists of Breezer Builders, a local NWBE, the African-American Planning Commission, and Lemley and Wolf. 
Next slide, please. Thank you, next slide, please. Thank you. This is a project we are proud of that really took into consideration the needs and the requests of the community to develop a responsive project. Glenmore Manor will be 11 stories and is comprised of 232 affordable rental units plus one supers unit. Approximately half of our units are family sized, meaning they are two to three bedroom units. There are heirs units for low income seniors. There are also units set aside for the formerly homeless. Over 18,000 square feet of commercial and community facility space that will focus on local small businesses are also included in this project. There are a plethora of amenities, including computer rooms, laundry rooms, fitness rooms, bike storage, tenant storage, and overall building storage. Over 9,000 square feet of land use, landscaped open space. And this project also includes 59 commercial parking spaces and the building will incorporate sustainable features. Next slide, please. Thank you. The Brownsville plan was an HPD led collaborative community process launched in 2016 and worked with residents, community partners and elected officials to understand the wants and needs in Brownsville. The Brownsville plan identified four overall goals to act as framework for the current and future investments in Brownsville. Those goals were to achieve equitable health outcomes, improve neighborhood safety, promote community economic development and foster local arts and identity. The process resulted in a plan to create investment in over 2,500 new affordable homes and the coordination of over a million of millions in critical neighborhood investments. Glenmore Manor was designated for Brownsville Site B, Christopher Glenmore, which was the innovation and entrepreneurship hub in 2018. HPD continues to share updates of interagency progress on identified projects and meetings, the goals and strategies set out in the plan through progress reports, online, online project tracker, and biannual community partners meeting. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll turn the presentation over to Erica Keller of Breeza Builders. Thank you, Makita. Good morning to Council Member Chair Riley, to Council Member Diaz, and to all the other councils as part of the subcommittee. Um, we thank you this morning for your time to listen about to listen about Glenmore Manor um, development. I am representing Glenmore Manor Managers LLC, which is a development entity comprised of Vista Builders, which is a local MWBE out of Brooklyn. Um, in existence since 2016. Um, Lemley and Wolf, which is a um, development general contracting firm, they will serve as a general contractor for this project um, out of the Bronx. And AAPCI, which is a social service provider, homeless shelter provider out of Brooklyn, New York. Um, Glenmore Manor is a proposed, has a proposed unit mix that is directly targeted to support the AMIs that we currently see in Brownsville today. Um, we have a formerly homeless set aside of 30%. Um, we also have received a 1515 allocation from New York City HRA to support 60 single adults formerly homeless, as well as 10 formerly homeless families with children. The formerly homeless income ranges are indicated between the zero to $63,000 a year, and those tenants will pay 30% of their income towards the rent. Or towards the rent, the rest will be subsidized. Um, the remaining AMIs range from 30 to 80%, which again are directly targeted to the AMIs that we see um, identified in Brownsville, Brooklyn. 50% of the units are for families where we have 75% of the total unit count dedicated to one bedrooms or more. Um, we also were able to um, take advantage of an heirs bonus where we have 16 units identified specifically for seniors ages 62 and above and eight of those units will be supported by project-based vouchers. 
um, the chart that you see in front of you is from the 2021 AMIs. Um, next slide, please. Again, as, as discussed in the previous um, slide, there was really thought about what were the current AMIs in the Brownsville community, and those were the AMIs that we were targeting for this project. So this slide, again, this project was sort of emanated in 2017 through the Brownsville plan and was awarded in 2018. So this data is from 2018, but I would assume that today, particularly given the aftermath of the pandemic that we are still somewhat affected by economically, I would assume that these AMIs are still very reflective of what we would see in the community for 2021. So you see um, the graph indicates that there's a cluster of income bands between 30%, between 0% actually and 80% um, as identified in the Brownsville area, community board 16 in particular. And in fact, again, those are the AMIs that we are targeting for the development. Next slide, please. This just gives you sight. Oh. Thank you. This just gives you site orientation. So the um, site is located in what we would consider the northern component of the Brownsville community. Um, it is, you know, it covers about three fourths of one New York City block. Um, Mother Gaston, Glenmore, and Christopher Avenues are the streets that. Um, the site will be located. There are 17 lots um, currently that will be combined into one lot for the development. Next slide, please. This site plan gives you sort of an orientation of um, the thought process behind the contextual design of the building. So as you saw on the site plan, there are some lower scale buildings that are closer to the Liberty Avenue side of the block. And then the buildings scale up as we have Glenmore houses as well as Howard houses on Mother Gaston and Glenmore Avenue respectively. So we start off with four stories on Glenmore Avenue, excuse me, on Christopher Avenue next to the already existing structures that are around that height. And then we scale up as we go up Christopher Avenue, going towards the Eastern location of Glenmore Avenue. So we go from four stories to six stories to seven stories. We are then at nine stories at the corner of Glenmore and Christopher Avenue. And then as you round the corner, through the hub entrance, it's back down to eight and then over to the highest point would be 11 stories where we are facing Mother Gaston Boulevard. We have been thoughtful in terms of the design to really support sustainability and a green community. And so we have solar panels, posts and rails that will be dispersed throughout the roof design. We've chosen that particular um, type of installation in order to remain as contextual as possible in reference to the design, post and rail and lower scale uh, solar panel installation. We'll have some terrace roofs, some green roof area that will be open to the residents. And we also have in the rear of the building a multi leveled um, garden. Um, open span space um, that will be open for the residents for outdoors enjoyment. There's, you know, an opportunity on the concrete area to sit and read, um, as well as landscaped area, um, all to be faced by the um, two story uh, Beeville hub, which will have a glass um, exterior wall facing this landscape garden so that there will be you know a beautiful view for those that are visiting the heart. Um, next slide please. So this gives you the ground floor plan. Starting off again on the right hand side of the screen we have Christopher Avenue's entrance for the parking where we are proposing 59 units um, of an attended parking garage that is zoned as commercial. Um, that space is specifically to be used to support the Beeville hub, 
both the commercial retail as well as the community facility spaces. We are in a transit zone. So as per the 2016 zoning ordinance, we are um, waived for parking for the residential facility. Um, as you go along Christopher Avenue, you see the various units that are on that ground floor level. And as we get closer to Glenmore Avenue, that is the entrance located on Christopher Avenue to the residential um, building. On the corner there, we've been thoughtful about having a sort of glass community room that will be accessible to all of the residents as well as residential support and a residential lobby and reception desk um, as well. Um, as you round the corner onto Glenmore Avenue, we have our first commercial space, which can be accessed um, from both the street as well as the Beville Hub Lobby, which is a two-story um, glassed um, entrance where we have open space that will allow for entrepreneurial incubators where we can have some glass partitions there for new businesses to have incubation space. Um, the first commercial space identified as number three is the Brownsville Beauty Salon, which is a, a for-profit um, entity that is an affiliate of a current not-for-profit entity called We Run Brownsville, which is an organization um, started by three, two women in Brownsville that focus on the health and wellness and fitness of African-American women and other minority women in the community. They currently have a running, um, a track and focus um, and are expanding to other areas of health, wellness and beauty. Um, as we continue down towards Mother Gaston Boulevard, we have our second commercial space, which is approximately 5,000 square feet. This will be occupied by Fusion East. This will be their third location. Ironically, their first building or their first restaurant is located in East New York in a building that was built by Hudson Companies, I believe, and related. They're on the ground floor of the affordable housing on Elton Street, I believe. Um, they also have a location in Interfaith Medical Center, a cafe, to service the employees there. And um, they have started an entree into the Brownsville community with a food truck on Pickin Avenue. So this will be their third location. As we round the corner on to Mother Gaston Boulevard and the last commercial retail space, we have um, Brooklyn Cooperative Credit Union. This will be their fifth location. Um, this is actually, I believe, the second RFP that they have been part of as community partners for a successful uh, development team response. So they have locations um, providing financial literacy and other economic and financial supports to the community in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Bushwick, East New York, I believe in Cypress Hills. Next slide, please. Again, this just gives you orientation of the building. In the far right-hand corner, we have the what, what would be the rear of the entrepreneurial hub. You see here from an aerial view, the landscaped um, tiered area um, in the rear, again, just shy of 10,000 square feet of open landscape space for the residential, um, for the residents, excuse me. And then you have a visual of one of the um, open spaces on the roof where you see the green roof as well as the terraced component and the solar panels um, that will be installed. Next slide, please. This gives you a visual at the corner of Glenmore Avenue and Christopher, excuse me, and Mother Gaston. Um, on the second floor, you see etched in the glass is Central Brooklyn Economic Development Corporation. That is a not-for-profit that has a 40-year standing in the Brownsville community. They are currently located at 444 Thomas Boylan, which is an older building. We understand that is also going to be renovated. However, in the interim, they ha are having difficulties in terms of their size and ability to service the community. Um, as well as internet and other types of challenges. And so here they will be expanding their services. They have a linkage agreement with Beth, um, Mega Evers College 
as well as Howard University to offer satellite classes at this location. Um, so they will um, occupy um, the great majority of the second floor of the Bevo Hub. However, one of the smaller spaces will be occupied by We Run Brownsville, where they will be offering their not-for-profit support of health and wellness classes for the community. Next slide, please. So our general contractor is part of the development team and they have been working with Central Brooklyn Economic Development Corporation as well as with Risa Builders to identify minority women business enterprises um, on the subcontracting level um, and other professional services to support um, this development. So we have already identified you know, that we have professional services um, in the form of title coming from you know, a minority business enterprise, African-American owned. We have identified subcontractors who have gone through the pre-qualification with Lemley and Wolf and will be um, solicited to bid on the 100% um, CD set that is now going out to um, potential um, contractors. And so we're working very closely to ensure that we are exceeding the 25% um, minimum expectation from the MWB Build-Up Program that HPD started in 2017. We are also working with Central Brooklyn to identify um, workers that will support the um, labor that will be hired directly from Lim Lane Wolf. As we are awarding those subcontractors, they will also have a local hire commitment as well as part of their contractual obligation. And so we will work very closely to ensure that we have as many um, people from 11233, 11212, as well as 11207 and 08 as part of the development um, process. Um, we're also open to working with other local community-based organizations in reference to local hires as well as referrals for minority-owned businesses. Next slide, please. So this, this development is, a, is, is an MWBE-led development team, which you know I'm very proud to be part of this development. I was born and raised in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And so to be part of the development team um, for this community is really uh, an honor. And I humbly, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very proud about being part of this development. Um, we're offering 232 units of affordable housing for families with a focus on supporting a wide range that is representative of the Brooklyn community. So we have seniors, we have formerly homeless, we have families that are in need of extra um, supports. We have 80% AMIs, we have 30% AMIs, we have 40% AMIs. So we, we believe that we're touching a wide range um, of the community. Um, we've made a special effort to ensure that two and three bedrooms comprise 50% or more of the development and that one bedrooms or more comprise 75% of the development once we deduct the supportive housing units as well as the heirs units. Um, we are very, very, very proud about the innovation and entrepreneurship hub and the fact that we have activated local um, organizations and businesses that will have an opportunity to expand um, in the northern section of Brooklyn. And we feel very um, proud again of, you know, the open space, the thought process behind that for the, for the building. And we are designated to go through the 2020 Enterprise Viewing Communities, which has just elevated the design feature requirements, solar panel installation, active design, as well as other sustainability to ensure that the building has a very compact footprint in reference to its impact on the environment. Um, and we have been very thoughtful about the amenities that we are offering to the community. So there are some general requirements, but we wanna make sure that these amenities are designed and activated in a way to really support the building in a positive way. We'll have a laundry room that will have additional um, 
machines in addition to what would normally be required. We have a fitness room, we have a bike storage area, tennis storage area, and we're really thinking about what have been our experiences in various developments and what do we think is the best way to move forward for our tenants in this building. Um, and again, the architects were very dynamic in their design of the open space in the rear of the building in reference to really giving people an opportunity to enjoy this space in many different ways. Um, last slide, please. Um, I think, you know, as was mentioned for the other uh, Cooperstown development, you know, these city-owned parcels are, are very storied. And this one has, you know, a very long story of 40 years of being vacant and abandoned. I remember passing it when we would go, you know, to the Jackie Robinson for me to visit my grandmother in Connecticut. I remember seeing this vacant parcel AAPCI has 25 years been engaged with um, the community in support of developing this parcel and you know, wanting to activate it for the community. And so here we are. Um, and even in the award from, from, from the city, it's, it's been a journey. We you know, started on it and then we got hit by the pandemic. And so we are very excited to be at this stage, which we believe to be the final stages of the EULA process. As indicated, we were certified in April. We've gone through all of the various hearings. There's been ups and downs in those experiences as well. But we here we are today at our city council subcommittee hearing. We expect to be with the full council hearing shortly with an anticipated ULIP approval, hopefully within the next month and a half or so. Um, we are targeting an anticipated construction loan closing um, in June of 2022. Um, with a 42 month delivery um, of the product where we expect to have permanent loan conversion by that 42 month period. And so we thank you for your time this morning and listening to our presentation regarding Glenmore Manor. Thank you so much, Erica. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, just like the first project, uh, this site has been vacant for decades. Uh, why has it taken HBD in the city so long to advance a development proposal for this site? And what was the original vision for the site from the 1980s urban renewal plan? Nikita, um, do you want to take that? Um, sure, I, I could jump in. Uh, Lin Zhang, um, again, from the Department of Housing Preservation Development. Uh, with all, all developments takes a really long time. And I think in this um, particular plan, it was designated for public use. Um, and so we've been searching through our archives before even this RFP. And um, there just hasn't you know, been any follow-up on this particular public use. Um, and so, so I think as part of this application, we're asking to change the use to allow for this um, particular and so now, you know, we have an opportunity here. We have a developer with a plan um, that, you know, that both has affordable housing and uh, retail and community facility uses that would benefit this local community. Um, so that's why we're asking that we could we could change what was designated um, when the urban renewal plan was first uh, implemented, um, so that we could allow for this project to move forward. Um, in terms of why it took so long. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if I could answer that if, you know, if there were a similar type of history that Cooper, Cooper Park um, Commons had here. I think it's just, um, you know, we didn't have the right project. Um, you know, we didn't have the right um, support. But right here, we have the need and um, certainly we have the right project, the right developer, and the, you know, the right unit mix um, to move forward. So. The borough president's report recommended that HPD and the development team coordinate with DOT to make sidewalk and street safety improvements surrounding this site. Do you plan to follow this recommendation? Definitely. Um, we are going to be digging into all of the recommendations and we've had follow-up conversation with um, Richard Barrick in the uh, planning and in the borough president's planning office. 
And so we do want to ensure that we're streetscaping and we're, we're doing, you know, supporting the building design in a way that, um, you know, is, is activates, um, you know, engagement for people into the building and ensures that there's enough lighting around the building. We've been very thoughtful about the design and we have, you know, a glass hub making it very, you know, professional looking in reference to it being a professional building for entrepreneurship. Um, and so we want to make sure that the sidewalks are increased to incorporate the traffic that will be going both Glenmore and Christopher Avenue or narrow streets. Um, and so we're thoughtful about that process as well. We have the parking garage that is right now is planned to be a stacked attended parking garage. So we have to be thoughtful about the design of that, the ramp going in and out of Christopher Avenue. So these are all things that we are being very thoughtful and deliberate about. You noted that your plan for local hiring and additional MWBE participation. How many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? Is there any plan to offer training to those who do not have experience in construction? And how can we ensure follow up and progress reports on these commitments? So, um, that was a long question. Let me see. It. I don't know if I can answer it in order. But <laughs> so let me start. I'm sorry, Erica. I could go. I could go through the first one. How many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? So, so it really ranges, right? Um, you know, 232 units. Um, you know, we're going to definitely need flaggers. You know, the general contractor um, is going to have their supervisory staff who we may or may not be able to commit to that being a local hire because there's often, you know, the supervisory staff is someone that they usually already have on board, but they may be moving for another project, but there's going to be flaggers, there's going to be laborers, there's going to be assistant support staff. Um, and so all of those staffs, I would say probably about 10 to 15 positions in this size building would be local um, to the general contractor directly hiring those those individuals. And then as we stated, we want to make we want those who are awarded, if we're able to make those awards within the next four to six weeks, that gives them time to be deliberate in making a commitment towards one or two of their staff also being a local hire. So it takes a lot of coordination, but I'm thinking anywhere between 10 reasonably on the lower end and 35 on the higher end could be local hires from the community to support either the subcontractors as well as the general contractors direct hire. Is there any plan to offer training to those who don't have experience in construction? So we're fortunate in that Central Brooklyn Economic Development Corporation, which has been a longstanding community-based organization that provides OSHA training and other supports in collaboration with developers in the past and on their own independently that they are funded for, is part of our development. They are a community partner in this. And so they have been already offering on training and will continue to offer training throughout the cycle so that we can also tap into their resources for local hires. And how can we ensure follow-up and progress reports on these commitments? So the community board was one step ahead of you on this. <laughs> and they, um, you know, really made sure that as part of our commitment in, in presenting the project to them in writing, we had to commit to quarterly reports to be given to the community board about our hiring process and how many and where we are and what attempts we have made. So that is a commitment we have made in writing to the community board. And we will follow it. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Council Member Dharma Diaz, do you have any questions or remarks you want to give? I have questions. Go ahead. <laughs> so I, I will start with my not concerns, but back to questions. How did you determine what facility should go into which buildings? So I think this was a little bit unique in that, you know this RFP was not just about housing. It was about, um, you know, an area that had been identified as a community, by the community as an area in need of support. And that's entrepreneurship and, uh, and, and innovation. And so what did we think about that? We thought about um, the fact that, you know, we're in a technological era. We're in an era of, 
you know, exploration in terms of entrepreneurs and how do people decide like millennials and, and this in the new generation are really driven towards being their own boss. <laughs> and so how do we support, you know, where the world is going in reference to that thought process and working, you know, what does public service really mean and all of the different new definitions for work and how you contribute to the community. And so we were trying to be thoughtful about that. We also, so we had to define it first. And then we had to say that one of the things that we recognize has been a problem is that there really hasn't been local participation in the RFPs, that developments come in and they don't necessarily reflect the people who are there. And so we want it to be inclusive, right, and talk about growth. So here you have a new building. There should be an opportunity for those that are already existing in the community to be a part of this new building and to expand whatever they are doing through this new opportunity. And so that was sort of the thought process by really going to local community members to see what are the services amenities that they had that could be part of this, that could help to grow um, you know, their services in the community. And so that's how we ended up talking with Brooklyn Cooperative um, Credit Union because that's, you know, that's a dearth in the community, right? There's like one Chase Bank, I think, on Pickett Avenue, and that's it, right? So we need to bring in economic support um, into the Brownsville community, particularly in this area. We needed to, you know, the restaurant was an opportunity. We knew that this was a successful um, entrepreneurship in another, you know, community nearby. Here's an opportunity to expand. Um, Andre has been very supportive, or Andrew has been very supportive of um, other smaller businesses and has talked about having some component where there's training for young people who are interested in being restaurateurs and such. Um, and then the same with Dion um, Grayman and Felicia Smith, um, excuse me, Felicia Stevens, who are, you know, the women of We Run Brownsville and the work that they're doing around health and wellness in the community. So we were very thoughtful about the entrepreneurial hub. Um, and then of course, you know, with the housing, it's really about zoning analysis. You know, the city was very direct in what their expectations were. It was currently an R6, which would allow a certain number of units. We had to propose um, a rezone to an R7D, R7A split, and that would then allow a certain number of units. And so then what does that unit mix look like? And, you know, AAPCI had really advocated for senior housing for this site for 25 years. Um, and so we knew that the direction that it was going, that wasn't likely a plausible solution. However, we wanted to make sure that we still included an opportunity by utilizing the heirs bonus to allow us to have 16 units for, for seniors. Um, but we also said now we have an opportunity to be very inclusive. So we have a supportive housing component through the 1515 allocation, as well as you know AMIs between 80 and 0% for all family types. Thank you. Well, thank you for your detailed response. <laughs> and, and great to see that Fusion is moving into Bronzeville. It's a definitely an exciting moment. I've seen him grow, him being at Andre and, and develop, to develop into the individual that he is today and willingness to give back. That, that leads me to somewhat of a concern. Having been an entrepreneur, knowing that going from working at home to now having to pay rent is a different, is a different conversation and utilities that come along with it. Do you have support services? Is there a cosmetic conversation for small business owners that are transitioning to this new journey to assure you know, a better possibility of good solid outcomes? So, you know, Brooklyn, so the, the, I think the um, only organization that is really going to be new to this will be the Brownsville Beauty Salon. Okay. They have a very small space. We're taking into consideration right now, we're performing to lower rents to accommodate what we you know, feel will be reasonable, um, but yet still allow us to, to feasibly represent a financial plan to the city. Um, 
and they have a small space. It's 700 square feet, you know, for, for their tea bar and, and, and the beauty and wellness component. So I think that they're, and they've been working now for supports for their for-profit arm and such, um, you know, Fusion East, we've continued to check in with them. So they're more seasoned, right? And so that was also the thought process was how do you tap into local businesses, but also tap into more seasoned because we are going to have to deal with our lenders um, for the overall project and they need to feel some comfort level about this space. Um, Central Brooklyn is the uh, not-for-profit partner. They will have the second floor. They're working to, to get the some financial supports as well. We want to have them um, apply for funding, both for their operations as well as for capital to help them build out this space. So we're trying to support them through this process as well. Um, and then they have linkage agreements with colleges and other organizations that will help to support um, you know, the services that what they want to provide. We, you know, we want to also have this sort of entrepreneurial incubation space, right? And, and that is, is contemplated for the lobby of the hub. Um, and that's a cost that we can kind of, it's going to be a space that we have to maintain anyway. So that is some way that we can kind of defray that and offer this to the community, um, as a space for them to, to incubate their, their businesses um, and, a, and a starting place for them. So um, we're, we're attempting to, you know, to be thoughtful around that and know that we're all challenged in reference to the finances now, given, you know, the, the rollout after the pandemic. Thank you. And as we know, housing is, is no secret, but my, my passion behind it and certain homeless services and ensuring that Communities to serve property. Is the site provider, is it going to be a provider on site for social services or their okay, yes. site? So, yes, so AAPCI is our social service provider. They are the not for profit development partner. Um, they have a 1515 award, as we stated, um, 60, um, 60 single adults and 10 families with children. Um, but those services that are provided, that will be provided through the 1550 allocation will be offered for everyone in the building. Um, and we have approximately 4,000 square feet thereof for these service supports to the um, tenants in reference to support offices and offices for social workers and meeting rooms, as well as the amenities, the community room, all of those are part of the services that will be offered, not only for the 1515 allocation, but for all of the residents. So you will have a social worker on site, not just yes. for the formerly homeless families. For but everyone. For everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then in reference to supported units, are they going to be integrated throughout your facility or will there be a targeted floor or side of a building? No, it has to be all integrated, right? So it has to be at least 65% circulation throughout the building of the MIH units as well as the supportive housing. So we've worked with the architect to ensure that design-wise, we've scattered everything throughout the building. Wonderful. Then my last question will be, in, in conversation with the borough president's office, there was a recommendation for the, the, the privately owned um, units, not our units, some um, apartments, Jesus crackers, I'm stumbling here, for the privately owned homes that are on this lot to not to be excluded from your conversation. Where are we with that? So we will, um, as part of our outreach, we usually send notification to, um, you know, our neighbors. Um, and so we will do that, um, particularly as we get closer to actually starting construction and, and other types of, um, you know, movement on the site. It's been a little bit dormant as we've gone through this process, but we will definitely include those neighbors so that they're aware of what's happening, and what the impacts will be. And there will be some access of it, you know, access agreements and license agreements that will have to be negotiated as well. Well, thank you for the human service aspect to it. And my question I think was more so to HPD, and I apologize for not being more direct and specific. And in, in where communities thinking that while we're being good natured today and including those four buildings as part of the zoning package, 
a year, five years from now, the owners will sell. And now we have 14 story buildings. All right, so now we have this land conversation that we, weren't, that we could have prevented, which that's, that's really where we were going with my question. So, um, so when we did the RFP, it was just for this site, the, the city owned the L shape um, lots that Erica talked about. Um, but in working on this Euler application with DCP, um, you know, they're, they're the ones who oversee um, the zoning maps. And there is a rationale to extend the proposed zoning district to Pickin, because I believe on that, on the side of Pickin, there, there's also an R7. So it's a way for continuity. And I think, you know, um, and so we, we had to take our guidance from our colleagues at DCP on that in, in order to have this map amendment. So, because I think they, they also want to avoid, if that was not mapped, right? I mean, there's still pressures that people get. And, and if, if they sell it to a developer, the developer would probably have to go back to the city to get that mapped anyway. Or, or another result is maybe, maybe the, the one that they wanna avoid is that you would have much lower buildings that are not contextual to the one that we are um, actually proposing um, right now. So, um, so that, was, that was a conversation, um, you know, a lot of back and forth um, with DCP and in, in, in sort of drawing the zoning map to make sure that it is not just with this site, that it's, it's done with the idea of like what the future would be and, and what the shape of, of that block would look like. But I do hear the concerns um, that you're you're raising um, about you know about people you know um, being kicked out of their buildings um, and and I I am you know I think what Erica said we hope that that you know with outreach and, and things like that we would not get to that point. I was puzzled by part of your of, of your opening statement. Was this more a matter of convenience? It's not a matter of convenience. It, it's more of, you know, it's, it's a planning rationale for zoning when, when they're drawing up zoning maps um, because we are upzoning this particular site. And, um, and, it, and their idea is that they wanted to make that connection so that it, it's more of a continuous R7 um, and that you don't have just like this R7 island in the middle. Um, so, and I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, city planning, I'm sure they could have explained this more eloquently and, and why, you know, um, that that was suggested and recommended um, in this application. So therefore my conversation should be with city planning. We could follow I, up and, I, I, and provide a, you know, a, a sort of response. And I believe our application um, also has an explanation on that. I'm definitely more digging and more conversation because what I see is displacement. It's just a matter of, of time. Okay, th thank you for answering the questions to the best of your abilities. Thank you, Chair Wright. No more questions. Thank you, Council Member Dharma Diaz. Thank you for your testimony. There being no more council member questions, this panel is excused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify on Glenmore Manor Project? There are no members of the public signed up to testify on these items. Seeing all the members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on LU 848, 849, 850, and 851 are now closed and the items are laid over. Our last public hearing today is on LU 847, the TMN 1002, West Harlem Renaissance UDAP and Article 11 tax exemption. Submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development Pursuant Section 693 and 694 of the General Municipal Law and Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The applications seek waiver of the designation requirement of the sections 197-C and 197-D of the Charter Pursuant and Approval of an Urban Development Action Area Project for such area and approval of an exemption from real property taxation for property located at 101 West 141st Street, 
aka 621-23rd Lenox Avenue and 121-123 West 144th Street. The both are located in Manhattan District represented by Councilmember Perkins. Presented for the applicants, we have Rosa Kelly on behalf of HPD and Randall and Rock Roland Powell on behalf of Infinite Horizons. I now ask that these witnesses unmute themselves and the council will minister the affirmation. Please raise your right hands and state your names. Roland Rosa Powell. Kelly. Randall Powell. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? I do, yes. Yes. Thank you. You may begin your presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Rosa Kelly, the Director of Land Use Planning and Development for HPD's Government Affairs Team. HPD is before the Council today seeking UDAP and Article 11 approvals for two buildings um, located in uh, Manhattan Council District 9. The project will be rehabilitated under HPD's Multifamily Preservation Loan Program, in which sponsors purchase and rehabilitate city-owned vacant and occupied multifamily buildings in order to create affordable rental housing units with a range of affordability. HPD has designated Infinite Horizons LLC to purchase and redevelop this disposition area under the Multifamily Preservation Loan Program through a request for qualifications. These buildings require substantial rehabilitation and, and there are proposed layout changes and major system upgrades. When completed, the project will provide approximately 51 units and two retail spaces. I'm now gonna turn the presentation over to the Infinite Horizons team to discuss in more detail. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Chairman Riley. Thank you for the rest of the subcommittee for having Roland and I here today to talk further about um, our project uh, located in uh, Council District 9. Um, my name is Randall Powell. This is my brother, Roland Powell, and we are the development team responsible for the substantial rehabilitation of uh, 101 West 141st Street and 122-123 uh, West 144th Street. Um, this project um, is a great project for the community because we're going to be um, rehabilitating buildings that were kind of currently underutilized um, that needed significant repairs to bring them back online in order for them to be used for the necessary affordable housing that the community needs as well as the entire city. Um, this housing project will incorporate both um, different uh, elements when it comes to construction as well as um, upgrades um, to the building major wise systems and we'll also be following the enterprise green communities 2020 um, requirements for uh, sustainability and resilience this project will also cater to uh, various amis um, from 30 to 80 percent of ami as well as a homeless population um, throughout the, uh, the these two buildings we believe that this opportunity is um, necessary and long overdue due to the current housing crisis and need that is taking place um, across the city that so many others that are on today's panel have mentioned. Um, one of the aspects of the building that or the project that we'll be working on is that we will actually be um, relocating a, a business um, to the space at 101 West 141st Street. We will actually open up a property management office which we believe will um, serve uh, the tenants to making sure that we can be as responsive and proactive in addressing any needs and concerns that come up um, during our ownership and management uh, during the life of the project. Um, we appreciate the city support in moving the project forward, and we look forward to um, completing this project over the next um, two years. We are in the process right now of applying for financing and as you can see, here are some pictures of the current um, building. On the left is 101 West 141st Street. That is pick number one. And on the right is 122-23 West 144th Street. Um, that building, West 144th Street, is currently sealed up due to structural issues. Um, and the tenants were temporarily relocated um, to make sure that we, uh, the city 
um, had their safety first um, while we put the project through the renovation process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here are the building details. There'll be uh, 10 studios, uh, 20 one bedrooms, uh, 11 two bedrooms, 10 three bedrooms. And as mentioned before, 101 West 141st Street has two commercial um, spaces, one of which will, we will use um, as our office for property management so the tenants can have readily access um, to any services that they require. Um, and as part of the process, we will also enter into a 40 year regulatory agreement um, to make sure that the uh, project stays 100% affordable. Next slide, please. Currently, the two buildings are both five story walk, walk ups um, and they represent um, in total of 51 units. Um, there will be a, a super at uh, 101 West 141st Street that will provide regular building maintenance. Um, the scope of work will include um, all requirements necessary to meet sustainability practices through the Enterprise Green Communities 2020, new electrical services, uh, new structural beam work, new plumbing, new kitchens, new flooring, new windows, facade work, um, as well as all the other requirements um, described by DOB to make sure that the, we meet all health and safety um, issues for the building. Next slide, please. Here are the income bands um, across um, the various buildings. Um, the first income band um, is for 40 47% of AMI, and we're actually going to try to move that to, to have some 40% lower, lower income units available because we know that there's a need for lower income units uh, for the project. The second band is 57% uh, of AMI, and the third band is 80% um, of AMI. And we believe that this um, marketing band um, for the various residents in the, in, in the area will um, bring a, a very variety of incomes into the neighborhood and into these buildings to spread out the opportunity for everybody to have affordable housing um, in the area. Next slide, please. Again, um, this slide gives the details of what the average um, rents um, would approximately be for the studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms. Um, again, the goal is to make sure that you know tenants um, have an affordable rent and they are not charged more than 30% of their income in order to um, have a sustainable household. Next slide, please. Um, again, we look forward to this opportunity. Um, Infinite Horizons, just to give a further background, was established in 2007 by my brother Roland and I with the need to turn um, projects such as this that are, have been underutilized into affordable housing. Um, we're city and state certified MBEs, and um, we have a track record of working on um, similar projects um, across um, the city. And we look forward to further um, working with uh, Chair Riley and the rest of the City Council and subcommittee members to bring this um, amazing project to fruition. Again, we appreciate the support of HPD and all of the fellow um, participants that have been on today's panel. Thank you and have a good day. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Roland and Ronald, uh, Randall, excuse me, uh, for your commitment uh, to addressing these needs in our communities. Looking forward to working with you both. And thank you, Rosa. Uh, again, from HPD. Uh, thank you for your testimony. There being no uh, more council member questions, this panel is excused. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify on LU 847? There are no. Well, let me check. If there are any members of the public who are here to testify, on this item, please raise your hand now. Committee will stand at ease. There appear to be no, no members of the public signed up for this item. Seeing no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on LU847 is now closed and the item is laid over.
That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you have written testimony on today's items, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or the project name in the subject heading. I would like to thank the applicant members, excuse me, I would like to thank the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, subcommittee council and land use staff and the Sergeant of Arms for participating in today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned.